Good evening. Is another huge wedge of alienation being driven between the provincial government of BC and the federal government? That's what it looks like on the SkyTrain caper, the unit trusts. But we'll talk about that after you've had the rundown. Is capital punishment an effective deterrent? It's soon to be debated in Parliament. Webster broaches a topic with Bill Dahm, Tory MP for Peterborough and a capital punishment advocate. Is a Forger report on UIC a reprehensible document, offensive and fundamentally out of step with our needs? Or is it just what the government ordered? Tonight, Webster takes Claude Forger to task on his UIC report. But first, selling ALRT track would have saved BC $6 million a year, but it would have cost the federal government $8 million a year in lost taxes. So Ottawa plugged the loophole. Webster asks Finance Minister Mel Cuvillier why. Mr. Cuvillier, it seemed you had a wonderful idea to introduce tax-free provincial bonds in a farm, uh, thereby going into the federal tax field and all of a sudden Michael Wilson has come down on you with a hatchet talking about retroactive income tax amendments and surely you should have known in the first place that he would act against you in this way. Not at all. I think for the first time in Canadian tax history, a federal finance minister has introduced retroactive legislation. With that single stroke of the pen, he has destroyed the credibility of our Canadian tax structure. There is no way you can write a perfect tax law. We all know that. And it has been historic that as these anomalies are, are, are uh, arrived at and determined, that they are grandfathered and then adjusted so that they don't happen again. All we did in this case was use a structure that had been uh, in place before, the tax laws made it legal, and we were not doing anything that required an apology. It happens right across Canada. We've got hundreds of tax lawyers and accountants, Jack, making a living out of designing instruments that, that are within the confines of the law. But surely there was some doubt in it, and that you should have checked, after all the fuss about other issuings in years before, checked that it was okay by Michael Wilson and the federal Tories. Absolutely not. You, what you do, the reason you check is to determine the legality of an action. It's what's called an advance ruling. And that's historic. In BC, we've been responsible partners and often asked for advance rulings when we were concerned about the legality of something we wanted to this do. This one you were quite sure of. There was no doubt no about doubt. the legality of this. But listen, the, the people in Ottawa are saying that uh, there were discussions before with Mr. Curtis and that you people were clearly aware of the knowledge that if you invaded their field, they would act against you. Absolutely not. There were discussions with Curtis on a particular deal that dealt with prepaid rents, another complicated kind of structure. And what Mr. Curtis did, because he was con unconcerned about the legality of it, asked for an advance ruling. Now, all of the correspondence, all of the dis discussions with the federal government and, and, and our government dealt with that particular aspect, and we did not proceed with it. Yeah, but let's look at the, the broad thing. You wanted to refinance your short-term securities on SkyTrain, correct? Correct. So you issued this at 7% when the market would, you might have had to go to 9%, correct? Correct. Right? correct. So therefore you're saving 2% on your own back, right? About 1.5%. 1.5%. And, 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 and then you're saying not only will you have them for at 7%, but you can have a capital cost allowance and you can deduct the income you receive as a shelter, right? Well, I, the, the, a shelter isn't quite the right word to use, but all right. Uh, in, in, in general, broad terms, fine. That therefore would reduce the federal income tax takes from these people who have a little bit of extra money. And it would also reduce the provincial income tax take. Is that not correct? That is correct. So therefore, here are you invading the federal tax structure. And if your ruling was, or if your step was followed by all the provinces, including the big one, you could massacre Wilson's predictions of monies to come in. Talk about massacre of the tax system. What about the SRT tax credit system? There were billions of dollars that thrown out the window by the government it was failing to react. And when they did react, they grandfathered them. Look at look at what they how they dealt with it with the, with the province of Manitoba. They grandfathered. Look at what they did with the province of Quebec. They grandfathered. Similar kind of deals. Nothing different really, except that it's BC in this instance. In other words, it's alienation, Del deliberate action taken against British Columbia. Yes, and furthermore, for the federal finance minister to accuse us of not playing the game properly as partners, for goodness sakes, is, is the most absurd statement for anybody to make. Now, what about the Genstar deal in 1985? Did they get the kind of deal that you are seeking now? 
in, in 1985, when this government was in power, GenStar created an, an, an artificial trust through which they could, they could, they could flow uh, uh, some preferred shares. The net effect was mm -hmm. that they, they scammed $275 million out of the federal tax budget. If we're partners, how come we weren't, uh, how come Wilson never asked us to approve the GenStar deal? He did it unilaterally, and he did it grandfathering it. But that was corporate, not individuals. Yeah, exactly right. And here we are trying to run a, a public a public transit system, cost a billion dollars. Federal contribution towards that was sixty million dollars, so that the wording on the damn tr cars could be printed properly. And here I am trying to save six million dollars a year in interest costs, and he says no. <laughs> here is what he says, talking about your government. Is a government that, that, like me, should be concerned about the integrity of the system, playing a leading leading role in endorsing and guaranteeing this type of tax gimmick. He can't wrap himself in that sanctimonious flag. Otherwise, if it is a partnership, how come he never got our approval to deal with Manitoba by grandfathering, Quebec by grandfathering, or GenStar by grandfathering? But this type of gimmick is quite proper within the federal tax law, is it not? Well, evidently, uh, east of Bay Street, that's allowed, yeah. For some strange reason, it doesn't apply elsewhere. Tell me about the ferry fleet. Was that the same kind of, when it was sold and leased back, did the people get the same benefits you're looking for now? Not quite. Uh, we could apply the same rules to the ferry f the sale leaseback as we've done with ferries and with a SkyTrain rolling stock and, and probably, uh, probably save a third of the $90 million we project to save with this proposal. But your point is quite simple and clear. You acted within the currently amended up-to-date tax laws. That's correct. And as I said, there's an army of people out there making a living doing exactly the same thing, and every time they bring a proposal to him, he grandfathers it. Now, does that mean that this deal is now dead in the water? Well, Wilson believes it is. I, I'm, I'm just struck by the wording he's used in his official written press statement, which leaves to some doubt. So there's some ambiguity about that. But that's not a major issue. As far as I'm concerned, I don't want any favors. If, 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 if Ottawa are going to approve this, then they do it on its merits. They don't do it on the basis of paying off an IOU. And they also said, of course, that what your gimmick is is a gimmick to help the higher income people of bought with tax avoidance. Absolute, no, no. Absolutely not. The, we, we, we deliberately structured this deal in $2,500 units. Can you imagine a $400 million offering in units of $2,500? Why did we do that? Because we wanted as broad a distribution as we could. We wanted to give every citizen of this country a chance to participate in those savings. And s to, to say it was aimed at the, at the high income end of the market is, is another outrageous fabrication. The re reverse is true. By putting it in such small multiples, we made it available to every Canadian. And and 20,000 of them have the wit to, 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 to order them. I wonder if anybody has actually got you committed if they've already paid for their stock to the broker and seen the prospectus. Might you find yourself with a few million dollars of this thing which even Wilson can't cancel out? Oh, I suppose that's possible. But I, you know, our Jack, I, I wouldn't want to hold anybody to a deal that we can't deliver on. And clearly, Wilson has kneecapped us here. But by God, he doesn't reverse what, he's, what he appears to have done by, by paying off any IOUs. Uh, uh, we don't want any favors. The, this, it, this deal deserves to stand on its own, and for the first time in Canadian history, he's denying it to us. Have you spoken to Wilson about it since the, his uh, initial statement saying he was going to introduce retroactive amendment to the tax act? No, I have not. I think that Mr. Wilson and I understand each other perfectly clear. Uh, I understand that there will be discussions at a higher level and they will proceed and unfold in due course. In other words, when Premier van der Zam gets back from Europe, he'll be after Moroni on the topic. Is that what you understand? Well, I believe that's likely going to happen. Meanwhile, there are you stuck with a $900 million deficit trying to prepare a budget for the coming session, correct? Yes. Will you have any money to spare at all? Will you have any money to spare for reforestation out of the $400 million on the 15%? Can you give me any clues about how tough your budget is going to be? Well, on, on the reforestation question, I, I happen to believe that our commitment was that we would do a responsible job in managing our resources. Now, we will, I guarantee you, provide enough money to plant three trees for every one we're cutting. That combined with what I believe is a, is a natural regeneration factor of 40%, plus our commitment to preserve the silviculture expenditures, I think will fulfill our obligations. The only point at issue is which pool of money or which pot of money those sums will be taken from. That's the only issue, and, and the that's an internal issue. We'll solve that. Sure, the $400 million has got to go into general revenue, and then you'll take what you think is justified to put back into silviculture and forestry. Exactly. Good, quite clear. Your calls to Mel Kovalier, the finance minister of the new government of Victoria, after the break.
we'll see how this goes down with people who've been listening. Go ahead to Mel Kuvalier, Minister of Finance. Yes, I'd just like to tell Mr. Kuvalier I, I'm, support what he's, I'm supporting what he's doing uh, because I think far too much of our money is going east and not enough of it's coming back. Uh, in all my dealings with people from the east, they really have a bad attitude in the west. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yep. Yes, I'd like to ask Mr. Kuvalier. He's wondering where the or you're wondering where the money is coming to pay for this SkyTrain. Mm -hmm. I was wondering where all the millions of dollars that are being pumped into these lotteries, you know, where are they going? We haven't seen any... Okay, what are we taking? $350 million a year in lottery purchases? Well, we take in a lot of money. Uh, and as you know, we've dedicated uh, a portion of those proceeds towards paying off the Expo debt. But in addition, we are spending the balance on worthwhile community projects around the province in relatively small sums. Go ahead, please. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Kuvalier. Good afternoon. I'm uh, glad to hear you finally using the term scam in regards to these uh, sorts of offerings, uh, be they private or public, uh, with your government. But you say these $2,500 offerings were so a greater proportion of the population could get a, take advantage of these things. Now, I'm a taxpayer who's already paid for that uh, white elephant, $1.2 billion. No one knows how to fund it and everyone's calling this a novel scheme. Was there an upper limit as to how much uh, one individual could purchase of these things? You say 20,000 people in percentage of population of this country. That's a very small percentage of the okay, population. Okay, you've could got a good question there. Was yeah. it an upper limit in purchasing? No, no, there wasn't, and I, I don't think there should be. Uh, but the intent, and as I say, the proof of the intent is the $2,500 units. Uh, in terms of the... Uh, you already paid for it once. Uh, that's not quite true. We've we, already we, bought it for it once. That's right. We, we spent the money, but we haven't yet paid for it. Go ahead, please. Hi, Mr. Cuvelier. Would this reduce the money that I would be paying on my hydro bill and the gas that I have to pay per liter? Well, uh, I can't... <laughs> I'd like to be able to promise yes, but uh, the sums of money relative to the total cost are so minute that it really isn't going to have any dramatic effect on reduced fares or reduced subsidies. Uh, which means that I'll still be paying for this and other people will be getting tax benefits for that. Is well, that what that means? Well, no, just a minute. I, you're oh, getting, yes, it does. Well, no, but see, that's something that's controlled by the Vancouver Transit Commission, not the provincial government. No, but he's, so, going, he's going to pay more taxes because somebody else is getting a cut on their taxes due to the investment. Absolutely. Well, or, all right, but I don't want to get into the question of fares or, or subsidies because no. that's something that's done by the Vancouver Transit Commission. No, no, he was merely making the point that I tried to make earlier that those who can afford to buy these shares are reducing yours on the federal income tax takes and the, the ordinary Joe pays a higher rate of tax because of that. Well, that's okay, right. But what about the other kind of approvals that are issued daily by the, by the Minister of Finance in Ottawa? I mean, isn't it time we got, we got one? I, I mean, if you're going to look at it that way, why, 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 why should all of these approvals be given for others except for one of ours? Especially for the GenStar type thing. Well, exactly. Go ahead, please. Yeah, Mr. Kuvalier, I'd just uh, like to tell you that I hope you fight this to the death, as it were. Gee, I don't know whether my wife would like that suggestion. I think it's clearly unfair to the West what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead from Victoria. Yes, I'd like to ask Ms. Mr. Kuvalier a two-part question. With uh, $20 billion worth of federal shipbuilding contracts up for grabs in the next 15 years, I'm really mystified why BC doesn't get out there and get our one-third share. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Well, I think that's a very valid point, and we have been getting out there, to use the caller's phrase. Uh, we do have reason to believe that uh, the icebreaker contract, for example, is going to come our way, although that's not firm, but uh, we are working very hard on it. Go ahead, please. Yeah, there's, uh, uh, you said that uh, you're going to plant uh, three to every one tree harvested, but what about the forest fires that we've been having here annually? Are, is, is anything going to be done to uh, repopulate those forests? To reboost the whole thing. Well, yeah, I, I think that uh, I can't get into those technical details. The ministry's responsibility for that. Uh, so I don't want to, you know, all I can say in global s terms is that uh, uh, with, with that three-for-one program, plus the 40% natural regeneration, plus our commitment to maintain and improve the silviculture standards, clearly that's what's needed. And as long as we agree to and do provide that, then where the money comes from is irrelevant. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. I'd like to attempt to direct a question to the minister. If I have let my medical insurance lapse, why am I penalized till April when I can't apply for medical insurance right oh, away? Oh, that's hardly hardly on the topic. Yeah, I'm afraid I don't know. No, you don't know the answer. Neither do I. Call me off the end. I'll get an answer for you. Go ahead, please. 
Hello. Uh, apparently, it is common knowledge among the bus drivers that the SkyTrain Corporation back east in Ontario was bankrupt. I was wondering if uh, Mr. Gavilia can uh, confirm Good or deny this. Corporation. Well, uh, the, the technology we purchased was Ontario technology. We are still, at this point, as far as I know, the only major purchaser in the world uh, that implemented a major system uh, using that technology. That firm, which was a, 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 a province of Ontario guaranteed firm, uh, I understand has since changed hands and been, been broken up. We do have guarantees with the province of Ontario uh, uh, supporting the, uh, the operating costs for a period to make sure we, we don't get, uh, uh, oh, I don't know, so to make sure it was a, uh, that it operates within the, the parameters of our expectations. In other words, that it performs it's properly. It's still guaranteed. Do yeah. I have another question? Yeah, uh, yeah but, uh, but the caller is on to something. Uh, by virtue of the, of the transactions that have occurred in terms of ownership, uh, our difficulty of collecting on those guarantees may be uh, made more difficult. Uh -huh. Second question. Hello, yes. Uh, I'm an electrician, and the linear, the linear induction motor on the SkyTrain is, is not a very efficient system. The well, uh, I don't want to get into an inquest on the SkyTrain because that's out with your expertise. Yeah, I, and, and as far as I know, it is working pretty good, but we've had to spend a fair amount of money to make sure it does. How was it you were able to come up with this brilliant idea to sell old bits of track on the ALRT for all these monies? <laughs> well, I tell you, it took a lot of, lot of bright, bright civil servants. <laughs> Go ahead from the Comox Valley. Good afternoon, Mr. Kuvalier and Mr. Webster. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Kuvalier, I think the the deal, uh, not the deal, but the shares you were offering with the SkyTrain was absolutely excellent, and I'm very upset with the federal government for not for doing what they've done to you. You boys keep up the good work, and Victoria and Mr. Vanderzam couldn't have chosen a better finance minister. Uh, thank you. We don't like these praiseworthy calls. No, no. Go ahead from Princeton, please. Yes, uh, Mr. Kuvalier. Uh, you say that these uh, shares were offered at $2,500 so the average person could get into it. It would seem to me that uh, since they were all taken up by noon on the day that they were announced, that not many average people got into it. Some of these thousands of people that you have working on the finances must have told the big money boys about it before we knew about it. Thank well, you. I'll hang up to listen to your answer. Sure, that's, that's true. Uh, an offering of this magnitude, uh, first of all, uh, was retailed. It wasn't underwritten in the traditional sense of the word, but because it was retailed, it meant that every major broker right across the country had all the details and was able to get on the phone immediately and call his own particular clients. So uh, to the extent that uh, someone, w you know, had a broker, then everyone in Canada had the same opportunity. One, you have to pay the brokers a commission. You have to pay the government. People selling the shares have to pay a commission, right? Had the deal gone through, yes, we, did, we would have had to pay commission. Well, those who have handled it now will not get any commission at all because presumably, as of this moment, it's dead. Yes, that's right. There should be no commissions paid if the deals are not made. Now, that's not to say that we don't have some cost associated with this transaction. Obviously, we spent a lot of money researching it, getting a lot of legal opinions. And the cost of all the bands, uh, bonds of nothing else, the well, unit trust. That's, that's, that's right. What, a couple of million? I don't know. We haven't got a, f a figure on it. Go ahead, please. Yes, I was wondering, do you think this is retribution from the feds for the fact that our forest ministry said that they were not going to use the lumber from the, the tariff on the lumber to uh, reforest the province? Oh, no, I don't think there's any direct connection, although, mind you, the same players are, are, are involved. But, uh, but uh, no, I wouldn't put a connection between the two. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, I was wondering about the term grandfathering. What does that mean? Well, it means that uh, it's tr traditional, that because you can't write a tax act that, that recognizes all of the possible interpretations of it, that uh, 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 people will bring forward proposals and, and, uh, and that the tax department don't like. Now, when they have a situation like that, they allow that particular proposal to proceed, called grandfathering, and then they change the law so that it can never again be done. One last question, just before you go. Is it in your considered opinion now that despite any talks that take place between Van der Zam and whoever, that this unit trust issue is dead? Well, I, I guess the ball is in the federal government's court. They've got to make the, they've got to clarify the wording they've used in the press release. But I sure don't want to have any IOUs out there, and we don't want any favors. This should stand on its own feet, and if they're not prepared to let it stand on its own feet, then uh, they, can, they can pay the consequences. But if he brings in an am amendment to the Income Tax Act, even slightly retroactive, you'll be l even more livid. That's right. My thanks to Mel Kuvalier. I'll be back after the break. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha!
Fagé is the Montreal economist who chaired up the Claude Fagé is the Montreal economist who chaired up the inquiry into the Unemployment Insurance Commission system in Canada. And before his report came out, Jack Monroe and Svoboda released a report calling his recommendations a reprehensible document. Now, there are many things wrong with UIC in this country, Mr. Forge. Did you really produce a reprehensible document taking us back into the dark ages? I think not. No, I think it's uh, a document that looks forward to the future and really tries to do better for Canadians uh, what we have been trying to do uh, with this uh, wretched program until but now. Your basic thrust surely was, one, UIC is far too expensive in the way it's administered and run, and two, there's far too much in the way of kind of welfare money poured into the scheme. Right. Could you give me the facts on that from your point of view? Well, about a third of the money getting into UI is really public taxpayers' money, and it's a subsidy for a, an insurance program. As such, it is intended to benefit the poorest member of the labor force and the poorest region of the country. But it's not doing that job very well. Two-thirds of that money is basically wasted to people who really don't need it from a, uh, an income deficiency point of view. So I'm saying this is a very legitimate purpose for taxpayers' dollars to go to the poorest areas and the poorest people, but let's do the better job of it. You're saying the taxpayers' dollars, the $3 billion subsidy into the $12 billion program, was making handsome uh, payments of UIC to the people unemployed at the time who needed it least. Needed at least because their overall income situation is such that they were well above the poverty line. They had other income going to them, and if we're really going to do a good job of it, you need to have something like income supplementation, like the child tax credit, that is really targeted at the right In people. In other words, you're looking at the, 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 the family with two wage earners. Right. One who's drawing unemployment insurance at the moment, the other one who's working. Later on, this one's drawing unemployment insurance, and this one's... Uh, working, correct? Right, that's one case. Uh, one, another case is people earning very high rates of pay for a part of the year and then being laid off. But their overall situation over the year is certainly uh, better off uh, than the people who are working maybe full-time, full year at minimum wage. In other words, the people getting the maximum under UIC of around $300, thank you very much, mm -hmm. with good paying jobs when they were working, much better off than the minimum paid worker who couldn't qualify for anything like that. Right, more than half the families in poverty in Canada have at least one member working full year, full time. Let's go through it in a little bit of detail. First of all, you did attack the structure of the UIC, the cost of administering the present scheme. How does that break down? Well, it's 28,000 people. It's the largest single piece of bureaucracy in the country. How Twen much? 28,000 people are spending $900 million, not on paying benefits, that's $12 billion, but just running the system, uh, the offices and the staff and so on. And in spite of all that money, everybody in Canada has, uh, has, has grievances, has frustration and resentment against the system because they think they're badly treated. And we have to confess that, that this is true. The system feeds upon itself. It's so complicated. No one really understands exactly all the rules and how they apply. The system has to be simplified. It has to be more consumer-oriented than it is. And for this, there is a drastic change that has to take place. Now, uh, you made a number of radical recommendations. One was involved in the payment of actual premiums themselves. At the moment, the share is, what, 40 employee and 60 employer? Yes. What would you do? Well, a unanimous decision of all the commissioners was to have it 50-50. 50-50 because they also seek 50-50 representation on a new board, a board of management that would run the program at arm's length from government. That would be a very important thing because up till now, the UI fund is so big and it's financed from premium, it's been used by politicians and regrettably almost like a, like a slush fund to finance all kinds of innovations in the field of labor and employment that have proved to be disastrous in many cases and have so complicated the administration that it's breaking down. This is an extension of the scheme, and you will remember, as I do, when Mackesy brought in the $100 a week unemployment insurance, what, 15, 20 years ago? Yes. Well, when he did that, he sort of uh, hijacked the notion of a guaranteed annual income, and he thought that he could implement a guaranteed annual income through unemployment insurance. Is that what's happened? This is what's happened, and this is, accounts really for the third of the money coming from general government revenue. It's an attempt to solve the problem of poverty using the wrong instrument. And as long as we try to do it that way, we'll never get a true guaranteed annual income or income supplementation plan, and we'll keep spending money and really pouring money down the drain to a large extent. Presently, I'm convinced that you have a draconian recommendation, which the government probably won't touch because this government can't make up its mind about anything, but you have some draconian changes to make which would reduce the amount of money 
going to the unemployed, and they would have to work much longer to get UIC. Am I wrong? No, you're right. This is uh, exactly what we're trying to do. We're saying, basically, as an insurance program, what people get from the program, the entitlement to benefits that they get, should be proportional to what they contribute to the economy, to their actual working uh, contribution and contribution through premiums to the program itself. Therefore, those people who have really short-term attachment to the labor force don't put in a lot, but they don't lose a lot when they lose a job because their pattern of work is, is part-time or part-year. Therefore, they will get smaller amount. And if, if they happen to be poor, not only unemployed or poor, there should be another program that will come to their rescue. You mean outside of UIC? Completely outside of you UIC. You say that $3 billion, which you reckon is a kind of supplement from government taxes, should not go near it, and the cost of unemployment insurance should run at $9 billion a year instead of $12 billion a year. Right. So that means fewer people would get less. Well, the uh, uh, same number of people or a uh, similar number of people would get less on average. Uh, because a lot of people now are getting uh, a huge subsidy. Uh, the very short-term worker are heavily subsidized. And it's not true, that, as a general statement, that the unemployed or the part-time workers or the part-year workers are poor. It's true in some cases, and in those cases where, it, where it's true, you have to have an income-related or income-tested right. program. Down to specifics. As of this moment, if I work for 10 to 20 weeks, am I correct? Right. I qualify for my level of benefits, and if I'm a highly paid worker, the maximum benefits, for 52 weeks. For 50, up to two, 52 weeks. Right. Would you change that? No, you would still qualify for 52 weeks. But? And it would be the same 52 weeks wherever you live in the country. At the present time, there are all kinds of rules where you discriminate according to place of residence. That would be done. One entrance requirement, 10 weeks, or the equivalent in hours, and uh, the same duration of benefits, 52 weeks. That but would remain. But the calculation of the unemployment insurance yes. benefits would be done on a totally different basis. Yes, relating to the past year's income. And uh, Just a minute, I've worked 10, mm -hmm. we'll say under your scheme where I implemented, I've worked 10 weeks. Yes. I'm entitled to 52 weeks benefit. Suppose I haven't worked at all in the year before. If you haven't worked at all, unemployment cannot help you now and cannot help you in the future. Then. If you're poor, you get social assistance. And nothing that we can do to unemployment insurance will change that. But if you have worked at least the 10 weeks, uh, then under our scheme or under the present scheme, you get some, some benefit entitlement. What we're saying is that this minimum entitlement should be there, but it should be strictly proportional to this minimum participation in you the labor force. Okay, I've worked for 10 weeks uh, this year, but last year I didn't work at all. Would I draw unemployment insurance benefit? Oh, yes. Yes. A very small, the minimum amount. The, the minimum amount, if, as long as you work for 10 weeks, you're entitled automatically to benefits. What, what would the minimum be? Well, the minimum we dip would depend on the, your wages during those 10 weeks. If you earn the maximum, uh, let's uh, the maximum insurable earning or more, uh, let's say roughly $500 a week, uh, well, you would be earning $5,000 over 10 weeks. You would be entitled in total to 66, uh, 66 and two-thirds percent, two-thirds of that, which would be about, let's say, $3,500 in total benefits. Well, that $3,500 would be then divided up into 50 installments that you would get, uh, one every week. Uh, so you divide it yourself, so 3,500 uh, divided by 50 would be something like $70 a week. And that's down from what you get just now? It's down from what you get, because then today you get 60% of your weekly wage, and 60% mm. of $500 is $300 for a year. Uh, so it, it's a considerable re reduction. Ah. It's a maximum de reduction uh, from that example. If I'm making 500 a week at the moment, I work for 10 weeks, I get 60% of 500, which is 300 a week. Right. If I'm making 500 a week under your system, that would be annualized. Right. And I'd only get $70 a week. That's a hell of a drop. It's a hell of a drop. Yes, indeed. But this is really what this can be meant by moving to an insurance basis. Now, you know, an insurance of any kind, compensate people for what they lose. Now, what has someone who only worked 10 weeks in the past year lost when he became unemployed. Mind you, your scheme may make good common sense and uh, equity, but totally politically unacceptable to a government under attack. It's totally politically unacceptable in isolation from other things. If there is a good income supplementation plan that takes the same amount of dollars on a national basis and on a provincial basis and gives that money to people who really need it more than those who receive it at present, it can be sold. Okay, one thing you can check me on. 
Many, many years ago, a BC cabinet minister, Jimmy Sinker, brought in unemployment insurance for fishermen. And when many, always people felt they were making huge money and none of it was taxed back in those days, and that, that was wrong. What do you recommend about unemployment insurance for fishermen? For self-employed fishermen, it should be phased out. Uh, because uh, insurance, unemployment insurance for the self-employed is simply a not a workable proposition. You have a, a situation where a person is an employee and an employer at the same time. How, how do you, you treat the risk? I mean, the risk is really something uh, that is in the con under the control to a large extent of the individual. That's why self-employed businessmen can't be covered. Exactly. One last question. At the moment, on if I can qualify after 10 weeks, Good-hearted employers will employ people for 10 weeks and lay them off so they can draw unemployment insurance for an automatic 52 weeks. Do you hit at that? Would you stop that? Yes, I would stop that because that would not no longer be so rewarding. And you may say, well, that's hard. This is, this is something that is uh, cruel even for people who now need that money. But well, we, ha we have to realize that as a society, we're giving signals to people to behave in certain ways. And we're giving the bad signals by having the system we have at the present time. One very final question. Having spent all your time and effort and looked at it, do you feel that now that it's been wasted because it will be politically unacceptable? Not in the medium term. Uh, the average duration between the report publi uh, report's publication and the implementation is from four to ten years. Look, look over the past at what has happened to the, ta the, the Carter uh, recommendations mm -hmm. and tax reform. Out in 67, implemented in 71. Uh, the previous report on unemployment insurance was out in 62, implemented in 71. That was nine years. So one has to be persistent, and one has to make sure that the public understands the issues before politicians will act. The final message is don't forget Forge. I'll be back after the break. That's a good idea to wear a microphone. Build on Peterborough East. Peterborough. Take East out. Yeah, Peterborough. The Mulroney government in Ottawa is so bedeviled by scandals, improprieties, morality, and lack of credibility that it's doubtful if they'll ever get round to one of the principal campaign promises, which was to have a free vote on capital punishment. The loudest voice in Canada calling for the reintroduction of the death penalty, described in the Stockholm Amnesty International as the ultimate in cruel, inhuman and degrading punishment that violates the right to life, is Bill Dom, MP from Peterborough. Now, I don't <laughs> think you, that your Mulroney government will ever get round to let you people having a free vote on capital punishment. Well, I think what is blatantly obvious is that the people in Canada are ready for some harder action taken by not only the courts but the legislators to see that there's a more just society and the protection of society against violent criminals. You want to bring back the rope? I'm very much in support as a deterrent of capital punishment for anyone who willingly and knowingly takes another person's life. You know as well as I do that this side and that side will produce statistics to prove that it works as a deterrent and that it doesn't work as a deterrent. I know for sure myself that juries will be much less eager to convict if the man's going to be hanged. Let me tell you, if I gave you the names of some of the murderers who have been in prison for murder, have been out on parole and have murdered again, you would be convinced that those murders could have been avoided had we had capital punishment. But surely the basic thrust for capital punishment is for a question of public reassurance and vengeance for society. I think that capital punishment has to be, first and foremost, a reasonable form of justice as accepted by society. Legislators have a responsibility to protect society. And when you have an inmate in a prison being murdered every 50 days in Canada, what protection is there for the prisoners and what protection is there for the law enforcement agents in those institutions when we're having that kind but of a But is the question rate? not best uh, answered by sheer civilization, that a decent society should not put anyone to death but just lock them up forever? No, I don't think that that is the answer in the protection of prison guards and police officers. 
If you were a person or I was a person in a maximum security institution with a life sentence for first degree murder and I was to decide after 15 or 20 years I wanted to escape and in the process of escaping I murdered someone, what's the penalty? It's back in again for life. Oh, I know that, but I see a previously unpublished report from the government that only about one quarter of Canadians support a complete return of the death penalty for all murders. Well, I don't support it for all murders. I would say that there's all kinds. There's infanticide, there's manslaughter, there's second degree murder. Those by far are the majority. But in Canada, we have over 200 first degree murders a year. And those are on the rise. And in the past five years, they have increased over 65%. And compare that with the United States, Jack, and you'll find that in the United States, over the past five years, with capital punishment, they have had a decrease of 23%, according to StatsCan, in the latest figures. Tell me, is Mulroney an abolitionist? Yes. He wants to abolish the death penalty? No, he wants to keep things with it abolished. That's what we have today. That's what I'm saying. Now, you remember in 76 as well as I do, it was supposed to be a free vote, wasn't it? And there was a six-vote majority which prevented the death penalty from coming back. Or for staying, yes. For staying. Yes. Is there any difference in this House of Commons? The NDP will vote solidly against the death penalty? How will the Liberals vote? The Liberals are free to vote as they see fit in this upcoming vote that will be this year. The Conservatives are free to vote as they see fit, and members of Cabinet have indicated their support for capital punishment, and other members of Cabinet are opposed to capital punishment. This will be the first free vote since Confederation on the subject matter because I don't think anyone watching your program tonight will agree with the fact that 1976 was a free vote. That was Cabinet solidarity, and if three of those members in Cabinet had voted the other way, we'd still have capital punishment today in Canada. And you'd be a lot happier today than you have been over all these years since 76. I can give you the names of 47 people that would be alive today had we had capital punishment for those planned deliberate murders. You're talking about repeat murderers with previous yeah. convictions. With previous convictions. But now we put them away, and oft times, most times, the judges say, no consideration of parole before 25 years. And that report I talked about earlier said it only costs $5,400 a year of adding one more convict to the prison population. Well, the report's wrong, because the Solicitor General, in his 1985 report, puts at $49,792 the cost of a male in a maximum security institution. So the report is dead wrong. So for Olson, the cost is 50000 a year. It costs more for Olson because Olson is in isolation for the rest of his life. And the estimate there is between seventy-five dollars and $100,000 a year to keep Clifford Olson. Give me your specifics on your bill. Are you writing the bill the government is going to debate? No, but I have a bill that they might like to consider. And my bill covers capital punishment for all cases. By what means? By lethal injection. Yeah. It covers capital punishment for the contract killer. That's the hired killer. Right. The serial killer, the person that kills over and over again. Mm -hmm. The kidnapper killer like Olson, who kidnaps, rapes, and murders. And the hostage taker killer. All of those definitions are in the criminal code in section uh, 214, 2 and 4. Yeah, but the fact is that many of these people are right out of the trees, are insane, and you can't hang, hang insane people in any society. And under our present law, we can't even keep them in prison without a hearing after 15 years. And here's something else for your listeners. Oh, 25 years no. before consideration on no, first no, degree murder. No, first degree murder, for the benefit of everyone listening, First degree murder is a life sentence mm -hmm. with a 25 year term mm -hmm. with parole consideration at two thirds of the sentence or 15 years. But can't the judges alter that by saying no consideration till 25 years? The judges can alter it, but I'm telling you they're up for parole and out many of them in 15 years and then sometimes less time than that. Polls. The last time we had a poll in British Columbia done by a prominent Tory woman, I think it came out at 82%. What are the latest polls in the East? In Toronto, in Scarborough, Paul McCrossin just finished his poll, and it came in at 90%, and that is the largest federal riding in Canada. Came in at 90% of 17,000 respondents. My poll in Peterborough was 87%, 
with 12,000 respondents. But let me get back to the parole just for a minute. Yeah. We have a situation in Canada today when we abolished capital punishment in 76, we had 16 people on death row. Those 16 people will start coming up for parole consideration next year. One of them's before the courts now for parole consideration. And it doesn't need 12 jurors to release that person onto the streets. Those are people that had gone through the total appeal and without any reasonable doubt at all, beyond any reasonable doubt, they were to be executed in 76. They're up for parole now, just 11 years later. And those 16 could be on our streets within a matter of five years. You will concede though every now and again if you win this battle that an innocent person will be hanged. If we win, no, I will not concede that because we have just completed the study in Canada of who has been executed since the year 1900 and there has not been one person in Canada that has been executed and later found by a court or a government Coffee. to have been in. He wasn't executed and he, he has never been found to be innocent. He was executed but he has never been found to be innocent. Senator Haber wrote a book he wrote a book and he said that this man was innocent, but that's not the court and that's not the government. Fair enough. Your reaction to Bill Dom. Do you want capital punishment by lethal injection or any other way after the break? <laughs> You see, you have new s statistics on the first degree murder increases in Canada. For the first time, StatsCan has put out the figures since 1977, when we abolished capital punishment. At that time, there were 202 first degree murders in Canada. In 1985, there were up to 338 first degree murders in Canada. They've been up every year since we abolished capital punishment. Does that mean convictions of? Convictions of first degree planned deliberate murder. Keep your comments short tonight, please. We've only got uh, seven or eight minutes. Go ahead, please. Yeah, uh, Jack, while I tend to be in favor of capital punishment, there are times when one wonders, and I asked Mr. Dom about the question of the Donald Marshall case in the, the Atlantic provinces. Okay. Donald Marshall was found guilty of second degree murder. If we had capital punishment in Canada, we would have it for first degree murder. There's no one advocating it for second degree. He would not have been executed. But he was later ordered a new trial. There's a new trial ordered because of errors in the trial, but he would not have been executed had we had capital punishment because he was not guilty of first degree murder. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello, Jack. I was a um, prison guard for a dozen years, and seven years ago my brother was murdered, and uh, I still don't advocate capital punishment, and I don't think my life was worth any more than any of Clifford Olson's uh, victims, and I don't see where they don't arrive at first degree murder more often. But my brother wouldn't be brought back by, uh, the police know who did it, but they want a conviction, and the person is running loose and probably will bludgeon someone to death again. Fair enough, ma'am. Not much you can say to that, Bill, is there? Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd just like to point out that according to the Solicitor General's Office of Canada, of the 382 murderers released between 1970 and 1984, uh, only 23 went back to prison, none for murder. Only four people in Canadian history have ever been paroled for murder and then murdered again. Do you agree with that, Bill? I have the names of four people who in the last uh, 20 years have been out and murdered again. And I also have the list of people who have gone out from manslaughter charges on first offense which isn't subject to the death penalty by anyone's imagination, who have gone out and ex-cons killed 27 more uh, and been charged with manslaughter in, the, in that same period of time. I noticed you don't put policemen or prison guards in there as a particular uh, category for which the execution would follow. They were added in 76. Uh, they didn't have to be first degree. Uh, when we abolished capital punishment, police guards and law enforcement agents were added uh, to the cause for first degree conviction. They never were in there before. Uh, what we had before was planned and deliberate uh, murders. Go ahead, please. Uh, Mr. Dole, capital punishment was set aside in 67 for a five year study on whether or not it was a deterrent. And a Dr. Feta uh, carried out 
a study on this and proved that it was not a deterrent. And the bigger fact of the matter is that capital punishment is a moral judgment, not something that laws should be involved in. You, you are not deterring people from doing it. It has been proven that people sometimes will commit murder just because they can be charged or can be sentenced to. Fair enough. It's a moral position. That's what he says to you. Well, I think he's also saying that there was a study done to show it's not a deterrent. Well, the most recent study that was done was just published in the daily papers by Dr. David Phillips, professor of sociology, and John Hensley, also a professor of sociology. They said the number of homicides in the United States decreased significantly after stories about murder, trials, and executions. Go ahead from Cranbrook. Jack, I'd like to say that I'm totally in favor of capital punishment. And why can't these MPs that we've got down in Ottawa take a poll of their constituents? I'm sure they would find that a lot of their constituents are in favor of it, too. Thank you. That's what you found anyway, isn't 87 percent of mine are, and I've been fighting for the return of capital punishment for seven years. Go ahead from New Denver. Uh, yes, Jack. I just have a comment to make. Uh, if in our society, if we don't take responsibility for the protection of our children, who's going to? That's all I have to say. You're in favor, I gather. Yes, I am. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to just make a statement. I'm for capital punishment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The majority, I should imagine, here are too. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Hi, Jack. I just want to say I'm no different than a policeman or a, a prison guard or my kids and wife aren't. And damn it, if you're going to do it, you should pay for it. I think uh, the important thing is that we've had a, a lot of trouble proving that it's a deterrent. We can look at the American situation since they returned with capital punishment. I agree with that, sir. Their statistics in the United States have clearly demonstrated that since they returned capital punishment in 1977, there has been an annual decrease in their homicide rate in the United States. There's no doubt, Bill, and I'm not trying to be funny, that the capital punishment is a deterrent to a convicted murderer if he's hanged. But it is a measure of vengeance for society. Justice is what is ever perceived in the eyes of the citizens to be reasonable. And if, if a person willingly and knowingly takes another person's life and society accepts that, as a reasonable form of justice, then capital punishment could be instituted by the elected representatives at any time. Go ahead, please. Yes, I believe that uh, capital punishment should be uh, implemented by our government. I also believe that it's clearly a deterrent, and I think that it should be thrown wide open in, in Parliament to let uh, each uh, MP vote the way he sees fit, and I think that perhaps it should also be thrown clear or at least wide open as a plebiscite, because I think the people are demanding that, that we be protected. Not vengeance, but clearly simply be protected by, uh, by Parliament without having uh, okay. uh, murderers running loose on the street. Let me put this to Bill. Uh, for plebiscite is not necessary, in your view. The House of Commons with elected members can make the decision without a plebiscite. There's a clear majority in the House now that would support it. I think that would be the short route towards uh, changes to the legislation. The long route would be a plebiscite. We'd still have to go through the changes to the legislation. And we could deal with plebiscite and all these conscience issues, but it would be very time consuming, and that's not the way parliamentary democracy works. Uh, no time for the last call. When will the bill be introduced? The bill uh, it will be in the form of a motion, I might suggest, in which we would endorse or not endorse a return to capital punishment. The government uh, would then have to take into consideration that vote and bring about the necessary changes, either through private members' initiative or the government. My thanks to Bill Dom, MP from Peterborough. Still six or seven years now, stumping the country for the return of the death penalty. I'll be back after the break. Looking for a job? Come with me tomorrow on a walkabout at VVI. Might be able to point you in the right direction. Also talking to Gerald Kaplan, the co-chairman of the Task Force on Broadcasting, and a story on UIC and pension complications at 5 p.m. precisely.